Ready? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much. We are about to start the, the open forum. So we ask uh, for the person that they say at the previous session, maybe if they want to continue the bilaterals outside the room. So um, on behalf of the OAS, we would like to, to thank uh, 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 our panelists uh, today. Um, with me uh, at my right is uh, Rob Strayer. He's the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Cyber International Communications Policy of the US, US Department of State. Mr. Victor Lagunes, he's the CIO of the Presidency of the Republic of Mexico. Mr. Loren Bernat, he's the Cybersecurity and Privacy Risk Analyst at the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. And Ms. Barbara Marquerida Aziz, she's Cyber Security Program Officer at the Organization of, uh, of American States. Uh, the purpose uh, of this open forum is to, to share with you uh, the efforts of the organization and its member states on, on the development of uh, national cybersecurity strategies and its, uh, and, it, and, and its international perspective. The OEA has been working on, on three main areas, policy development, capacity building, research, and outreach. On the policy development, uh, basically working on national policy and strategies. There is a new working group that has been established on confidence building mission on cyberspace, on technical capacity building, uh, working on cyber exercise, development of certs, law enforcement training. There is a platform that is called CSIRT Americas for information sharing with certs and um, research and outreach more focused on the development of technical documents, a uh, cybersecurity observatory, awareness raising, and uh, Jordan, um, Jordan awareness. Uh, this year, there have been different uh, direct or indirect uh, beneficiary countries uh, through the participation of training, through the CISER Americas platform, or through the uh, different reports. These have been the different countries that have received direct assistance uh, with activities in situ or to uh, have adopted uh, or have engaged with the process of national strategies. Uh, to the date, uh, we have eight countries that have adopted uh, national cybersecurity strategy. The last one has been the, the government of Mexico. That's why we, we, we invite uh, uh, Mr. Victor uh, Lagunes also to, to share how was this process uh, of development of the, of the Mexican, uh, Mexican strategy. There are three other governments that are starting uh, this process, which are Guatemala, Argentina, and Dominican Republic, and also other governments that are starting with, and they are not called yet, which are Peru, Honduras, and other Caribbean member states that we are gonna uh, engage in in 2018. As I mentioned uh, earlier, there is a one confidence building measure working group that was established by OAS resolution in April 2017. And the first meeting of this working group, which uh, we hope to, to research and consensus, will take in place in February 2018. Um, these are some achievements on, on the third side. Uh, uh, basically, since 2014, uh, uh, Four, there are now 20, 20, 21 certs. Uh, there are certain numbers of certs which we have given direct assistance. Uh, we're looking forward to next year having Dominican Republic and Guatemala uh, on board um, and having more exercise carrying out and actually, uh, well, continue with certain evaluations on, on, on in, in certain countries. Um, there is a a platform for information and communication sharing for government, only government certs, uh, uh, including uh, academic certs that we are working and trying to, to reinforce and actually promoting early warning uh, alerts, um, which is um, the Cecil Americas. There is a, a one case that has been very famous, not just for just the impact, uh, 
actually uh, all the rich that have a worldwide are actually um, today we we receive the the news uh, uh, about the, the potential source of, of the of the WannaCry incident um, on training there are more than 10,000 officials that have been trained uh, over the over the past years more than four or five thousand over the past two. Uh, there are some results of, of the impact of this training. Uh, of course, focus on, on, not just on government, but actually on private sector academia. And there is a new project that is funded by the City Foundation, which is focused on, on youth, uh, and is looking to create a career path in digital security. Primary countries were Colombia, Peru, Panama, and Trinidad and Tobago, and now we are expanding to Dominican Republic and Costa Rica. Uh, these are some of the research that um, technical documents uh, looking to release one on critical infrastructure in, in March, another in about the banking or financial sector in the first semester of 2018. Uh, we just wanted to give you a, a global overview uh, of what we were doing. Uh, and again, uh, I believe Victor will give you uh, uh, an overview of how was his work or, uh, what was the work of the government of Mexico, which somehow could be very similar in other countries. Uh, we will invite uh, Professor Ayer to, to give the international perspective of the U.S. government, uh, which is uh, probably very cohesive with other member states. And of course, uh, we will invite our colleagues at the OECD to share uh, their perspectives on why they're looking towards uh, national cybersecurity uh, in, in mutual member states, uh, OECD and OAS member states, and of, if possible to share their, their experience uh, in, in, in this process and what they look forward for, for this. So, Victor, if, if you want to continue. Thank you so much, Belisario, and thank you so much for my colleagues here in the panel. Uh, it's an honor uh, for your time. Um, we, uh, we set out in Mexico this uh, early in the year um, a different process to be able to hopefully en uh, engage the community and um, in uh, an idea of publishing later on the year what could be an encompassing and overarching uh, national strategy on cybersecurity. Um, the main uh, reason why we, uh, we, we tried to a different approach was over the last years uh, there have been other uh, you know, national uh, state level um, and different organizational approach that uh, were created mainly from a one to many, basically from the government to the citizen in, a, in an effort to create it rapidly, a public policy document or a strategy. It created a lot of resistance, a lot of friction with different groups uh, in society, not only civil society, but also academia, technical sector, and, and so on. And uh, it was rapidly dismissed. And uh, we, we learned um, that it was not the right approach uh, today to create a policy that was supposed to create certainty and trust uh, in a newer ecosystem or a digital ecosystem without the feedback and, the, and, and really the, the, the answering the questions that civil society had uh, specifically. So we started by uh, di diagnosing uh, the country status. We didn't have a lot to go on at the very beginning. There were a lot of uh, global numbers, statistics, and so on. And of course, we tried to extrapolate those into a national um, um, impact. Um, then there, we, we, uh, we were able to create some numbers nationwide. Um, any, any, anywhere between, dif it differs how you, uh, it differs how, different how you measure it, but anywhere between three to five uh, billion or five uh, billion US dollars are lost are lost due to cybersecurity um, vulnerabilities being exploited or cybercrime as uh, within itself. Um, that creates a big issue and also it's, it's growing exponentially, not only in Mexico but in the whole region. Um, it, um, f Mexico has around 70% of, of, of people connected. So we still, you know, we, we came from the last five years of having half the country not connected to, you know, 70% growth. So still we're having the first generation kids, first generation teenagers, you know, holding a handheld for the first time. That creates a specific scenario for Mexico, which is very advanced in many levels and many sectors, but also some people are connecting f uh, for the first time 
into, uh, into a, a, the digital uh, world. Um, we, as I mentioned, this year we created, with the support of the OES, a collaboration um, platform that, uh, was, um, that was done through um, many forums and, uh, and, and, and debate tables and debate um, um, uh, events. Uh, we created three workshops and two forums in which we invited and we, uh, not only the OES as observer, but actually a, a, as an active participant and uh, also as a, as, a, as a vehicle to invite other international um, experts that could provide feedback and their own contributions into the process. Um, we published the, the, an open document that was co-created with, the, with, the, the, with, the, with civil society and the, and the citizenship as a whole. So we're glad to say that when the, the document was published, it, it was actually crowdsourced or co-created with, with the whole citizenship and also the civil society groups. Next, please. I mentioned here the five different events that we had, and it's important to highlight that we wanted to mature the conversation within the country. And by saying so, we didn't leave any topic behind. And it's usually uh, said and stated that cybersecurity, once implemented, it goes against some uh, other criteria such as privacy or data protection or you know, censorship, um, monitoring, and so on. The reality is that we set out this strategy as a parallel document and as a parallel uh, initiative so that we can mature the conversation within those groups and we can actually debate those topics and reach common points um, beforehand. And then once we had the, the, the public policy public, uh, public, uh, um, uh, published, it was actually signed off by all the different groups. And we created a, a, a different dynamic and a different synergy because of that. Next, please. So on October 11, uh, we created a subcommission within the government, within the government of, of the Ministry of Public Affairs in Mexico. And that's a vehicle in which we were able to publish the document. And also from there, we, um, we, we published the, the strategy. Next, please. It encompasses five objectives, um, society and rights, economy and innovation, public institutions, public security and national security. Next, please. And the overarching uh, initiatives on cross-cutting topics that we mentioned here are really the task force forces or the groups um, or the different initiatives that are gonna be drilling down in different projects that we're gonna be working on over the next months. Culture of cybersecurity or cybersecurity awareness. This is mainly around education. Um, a lot of awareness campaigns within the Ministry of Education, but also the federal police and the cybersecurity units to be able to educate our children in different sectors, more vulnerable sectors, into, into what it is to be connected. Capacity development, talent, and of course, uh, technology. Coordination and collaboration nationwide and international. ICT research development is done uh, directly in collaboration, of course, with ac academia. Standards and technical criteria, same um, same area. Critical infrastructure as it pertains to, of course, energy, oil and gas, but also the banking sector and financial sectors in the country. Legal framework, we need to still find better ways and more agile ways to follow suit in terms of new, new crimes or new cyber crimes and how that pertains to legislation and so on. And measuring and monitoring to be able to implement a feedback loop that is positive enough and agile enough to be able to, um, to, to implement cybersecurity policies. So we, uh, we have it published both in Spanish and English on this um, uh, URL. You're welcome to, to go and read it and, and highlight it and provide um, comments and, uh, and questions to us from there. And um, overall, this is the first, uh, one of the steps towards strengthening and establishing more, um, more trust um, and a, a more a certainty within the environment in the country. Um, hopefully we're, we're able to, to create the second and third steps rapidly to be able to implement uh, a strategy uh, full blown in the next six months. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Victor. Rob, so the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us today.
Thanks, Belisario, and thank you to OAS for organizing this, this session. Uh, given the global and interconnected nature of cyberspace, the United States recognizes the importance of working with our allies and partners to realize our vision of an open, interoperable, and reliable and secure internet. And we realize this is particularly important in the Western Hemisphere. As an international community, we are dependent on our collective cybersecurity capacity, and we are each only as strong as our weakest link. The United States has therefore identified the full range of cyber issues, including international security, cybersecurity due diligence, internet governance, and internet freedom as a national and international policy imperative. In carrying out a key priority objective of this administration, the United States Department of State promotes the U.S. vision for cyberspace by actively working with our close partners and allies, by working with emerging cyber states, and even working with states that we don't always see eye to eye with. As part of our approach to cyber engagement, U.S. cyber diplomats in Washington and around the world work closely with our technical experts, law enforcement officers, and other key stakeholders to articulate U.S. cyber policy and respond to cyber threats, stressing that security and freedom in cyberspace are mutually reinforcing concepts that can and must be achieved together. Cyber capacity building programs provided by the State Department are one way the United States offers policy, legal, and technical support to nations aiming to increase their access to and achieve the full benefits of the internet and ICTs. The United States works with global partners to shape the global agenda for cyber capacity building to meet recognized cybersecurity best practices. These efforts allow us to coordinate with like-minded partners to better leverage limited resources, both human and capital. Our programming stresses the following key elements. First, the State Department leverages foreign assistance tools and resources to assist our partners in developing and developing sustainable security incident response teams. They're capable of engaging stakeholders and assessing the needs and offering technical assistance when appropriate to improve our collective ability to combat cyber threats. Second, we focus on national strategy and policy development, where new digital economies, new national cyber agencies, and new national policies are emerging, the United States assists countries to develop and implement well-crafted national cyber strategies, policies, and agencies that are uphold an open, interoperable, secure, and reliable cyberspace. The State Department leads U.S. government efforts to assist countries in creating national cyber strategies, policies, and agencies aimed at improving their cybersecurity capacities while also supporting fundamental freedoms, privacy, and the free flow of information. The third element is cybersecurity awareness raising. Public awareness campaigns raise awareness of cyber-related threats and best practices worldwide, and they empower citizens with the knowledge and a sense of shared responsibility to practice safe behaviors on the internet. In that regard, we partner with NGOs, multinational organizations like the OAS, the private sector, and educational institutions to increase awareness of cyber vulnerabilities. We often find that when partners come to the table ready to improve their cyber capacity, they are e eager to make progress in all of these areas. However, where possible, we advise them to begin first by articulating their national aspirations and then focusing on the development of policy framework that can support those goals. Towards that effort, the U.S. State Department has partnered with a federally uh, funded research and development corporation called MI the MITRE Corporation. With them, we've created a national cyber strategy engagement plan for our diplomats to use when assisting partner governments in their national cyber strategy development and implementation efforts. The engagement plan is highly flexible and based on a comprehensive study of existing cyber tools, including CICTE's methodology. Our engagement plan focuses on eight elements that cover a range of foundational governance, operational, and enabling capabilities that we believe provide the foundation of an effective national cyber strategy. I think it's worth noting here that because to some extent these are common elements found in our approach, SICTE's work in the region and even the preferred methods of our partners represented here today. Those elements include strategic foundations, policy and governments, in, in other words, where we look at relevant standards and regulation that inform the policy and governments in a country, thinking about the, the resources, the allocation distribution of resources that are deployed to cybersecurity, risk management, a risk management approach that is essential to national strategy development and implementation because it allows a country to measure the vulnerabilities against realistic threats and available resources. 
We also look at cybercrime. This is referring to a country's capacity to prevent, identify, respond to, and prosecute cyber and cyber-related crimes. Next is key partnerships. We think about both internal and external partnerships that can support a nation's cyber strategy. And the last element is cybersecurity culture and workforce, relating to the education continuum that encompasses public messaging, cyber-related skills and job training, and expert-level training for particular cybersecurity functions. It's important to recognize that every government, including the U.S. government, would prioritize these differently. The goal of our engagement is to identify priority areas for additional work to help strengthen and implement our partners' cybersecurity strategies and to provide actionable quick wins as well as long-term steps that they can take to address those priority areas. We have been fortunate to see firsthand SICTE's successful engagement on national strategy development and implementation in the Western Hemisphere. SICTE among the first and most dedicated in carving out a methodology for this process. We have gladly contributed to this effort, most recently through our participation in a week-long roundtable discussion in Mexico City in April, and as well as in July. On that note, I would like to recognize the government of Mexico for its achievement of accomplishing its national security strategy that Victor just explained. From our perspective, CICTE's efforts have strengthened our collective security, and we look forward to continue to cooperate with them. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob, for, for for your inputs and participation. So, Laurent, thank you very much for, for being today, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, the OECD has been working for many years in the area of digital security, and I was lucky to participate in two of the uh, exercises that OAS has uh, carried out with uh, <coughs> um, Colombia and Mexico to help the country develop a national cybersecurity strategy. Um, I, I could go through what uh, OECD recommendations and instruments and documents, uh, but I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to focus on a, a, f a few messages that are probably the most important, at least from my perspective, taking into account my experience with the work with OAS uh, in these countries. And um, uh, these, these messages are the following. The, the first thing that a government faces when it tries to develop a, a national cybersecurity strategy is that it thinks it's developing, it's addressing one area, and it is to some extent addressing one area, but in reality it is addressing a multifaceted area. Uh, it could be seen as several areas brought together. So it needs to develop a holistic policy framework for something that is multifaceted that has different facets. Uh, we, we, we could discuss forever how many facets and which ones there are. For us, there are, we can simplify it to four. The first, and, and there is no order in there. The first one from an OECD perspective is economic and social prosperity. You want security because you want to uh, realize the full benefits of ICTs for innovation, for growth, for prosperity, for social progress. So that's one objective. But you also want security, uh, uh, digital security, cyber security, to fight against criminals. So that's another objective, cyber crime. And there are also cyber security issues related to uh, defense, uh, conflicts prevention, um, intelligence, and other aspects related to national security and international security. That's another facet. And I should have perhaps started with the fourth, the, 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 this one. There are technical aspects to cybersecurity, and that's also a huge area that has to be addressed, and it relates to standards, etc. These four facets are not easy to, to work together with. They, 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 they sometimes uh, they complement each other, but they also compete with each other. And, and the governments have to find the right mechanisms to balance these four, four uh, dimensions in order for them to really complement, help each other, and not undermine each other. So that's the first aspect. Uh, and it relates to the, the governance challenge that governments have to face and the, govern the appropriate government mechanism, the appropriate uh, mechanism that uh, will do this balancing ex exercise the best and most appropriately uh, varies across countries. The other important message is that from an economic and social prosperity perspective, uh, and this has been said before, but it, it's not always very well understood. This is a risk management issue. This is not that the policy should as create a safe and secure digital environment because this is just not possible. It's, it's, the policy has to 
um, um, uh, educate, promote an approach to digital security with, which is based on the management of risks to economic and social activities. That means that everyone has a responsibility in using ICTs or in developing ICTs to, to enable, uh, to, to manage the risk or to enable users of ICTs to manage the risk. Risk management is extremely important because when you actually secure something, you're also, to some extent, limiting something else. So if you, if you think you are going to have a safe and secure environment, you will definitely close it and you will reduce the potential to use it for economic and social prosperity. By managing the risk, uh, um, uh, taking into account the context, you will um, um, uh, help achieve all the benefits from um, uh, the digital technologies. Um, a third message is because everyone shares some responsibility according to their role, um, cooperation is essential, uh, which means that um, all stakeholders have a role to play and all stakeholders should be part of the development of the policy. How you do that will again vary across countries in the details, but cooperation is essential. And, um, what, uh, and that takes me to my last point. Uh, we always say cybersecurity aims to create trust, to enable trust for, uh, again, from an OECD perspective, from the digital economy to fr flourish, for uh, um, growth and prosperity to, uh, to, to take place. Well, you also, if you want to, uh, to, to reach this trust objective, you need to create the conditions for trust to be there uh, to develop the policy. The, the relationship between the stakeholders in order to, uh, between all the stakeholders, including the government, in order to develop the policy and to implement it is not a one-off. It's not something that, oh, I'm going to have a multi-stakeholder process in order to develop the, the strategy. It's a long-standing trust relationship that you want to establish taking the opportunity of creating the strategy. It's a long-standing relationship, trust relationship, because all the stakeholders will have uh, to uh, implement the strategy in every action they will take every day on using ICTs. So it's, it's, it's a fundamental element. Trust is an outcome, but you need to have it as, in, as an input. So you need to have all the stakeholders at the table and to create this trust relationship with them. So that would be my, my, uh, my four ideas. And to, to finish with, uh, with, with this uh, statement, I would, I would say that uh, the uh, one interesting aspect of the um, initiatives by OAS is that uh, by bringing uh, uh, international experts in, uh, in, in countries, they could create the condition, could create the conditions for such a trust to be established. We, 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 I, I must admit I, I ended up with some colleagues from other parts of uh, uh, governments and, and business in, in a big room with many officials from the country, and we didn't know anyone. And we were uh, put in a situation to, uh, at the end of this uh, journey, after a week of work generally, we ended up having a fair discussion, a very neutral and balanced and so, and discussion with the host country uh, in a very independent way. And that was really, a, I think, a, an interesting exercise for us and, and uh, I believe a very, good, a very useful exercise also for the, for the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren. Um, Can you hear me? Yep. Is it? Okay, because I cannot hear me quite well. It's working? Okay. Um, I'd just like to make a summary because I really liked how Laurent finished it with the, the J of trust as an input and as an outcome. Well, in the cybersecurity program at the OES, for us, we work as facilitators. And this is actually our second open forum. The first one was last year, and the topic was basically about our work. And National strategy was the main focus. That's why we decided this year, let's focus on national strategy. And the 2017 was a very interesting year because we got four countries in the region approved strategies, not only Mexico, but also Chile, Costa Rica, Paraguay, and uh, Chile, Costa Rica, Paraguay, yeah, and Mexico. And so we thought, let's talk about national strategy and because it is a learning process for us. And trust, as Laurent well put, uh, I really like this sentence, um, that's what we try to do. How do we foster this multi-stakeholder approach and a better engagement? And the Mexico experience, 
Uh, I was very pleased Victor also pointed out that this importance of building trust and having all these uh, missions for engagement. And now we have to discuss the implementation. That's the next step. And also how important it is trust again for this process because it needs to be the outcome of it. And I find very interesting trust and also so many things that we have to do. Uh, Rob and, and Laurent also with different ways of saying, putting it one mentioned area that focus areas, other mentioning other dimensions, and how are you gonna put this together and so, so many challenges do you have? Economic, for, uh, social conflicts, uh, shared responsibility with all. So it's a lot of challenge, so we, we still need to keep now the next step to make sure that it still continues. So I think it would be interesting to listen and all from maybe perhaps from the panelists, but also from the audience a little bit about how do you think we build this trust, you continue building this, this cooperation mechanism, and make sure that all stakeholders are still engaged in this process. If there is any question as well, mm -hmm. we're glad to, to answer that. Any question from the floor? Uh, yeah, um, hi. Uh, thank you uh, for your uh, comments. I'm, I'm from Brazil. Um, I have some thoughts. Uh, w w we've been working in Brazil on a, a national strategy for uh, uh, information security. And um, I'm from the Minister of Foreign Affairs. And uh, this was a debate that basically involved uh, uh, Minister of Defense and, and uh, um, military people, but also uh, civilians and people from other ministries and uh, I felt that uh, by dealing with this issue we uh, had to face some sort of uh, silo dilemma concerning uh, who was in charge of what and uh, to what extent uh, dealing with uh, security of information and data security we were not uh, at the same time uh, dealing with, with aspects uh, that had to do with privacy uh, and the privacy of personal data uh, because basically from a perspective from someone dealing with uh, uh, law enforcement uh, the tendency is to try to protect information uh, uh, even if by uh, uh, isolating it by uh, uh, denying access to it and then uh, and it goes to, to what Laurent was saying. I mean, uh, you can always protect information by isolating it, by denying access to it, and that's it. Uh, but, but then you have this problem with uh, the economic value of data, of information. This is one aspect. So when uh, uh, this topic is dealt by uh, people from the security uh, uh, branch of the government and, and et cetera, they tend to consider it as a national security problem, et cetera, et cetera. And then uh, the tendency is to try to protect, uh, despite what Lauren said about uh, the economic value. But there is also another issue that has to do with uh, the, the privacy value of things. I mean, uh, personal data is uh, 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 something that should not be dealt with as uh, in, in the same way as, uh, for example, uh, public information or sensitive government information. So we, we also had to face this dilemma. Uh, uh, to what extent a government agency uh, uh, should be allowed to uh, um, sur uh, have surveillance over a, a, a private data in order to uh, uh, protect people from uh, uh, you know, uh, cyber breaches or whatever. So there's some, some uh, thoughts that came up uh, from my experience. Uh, we at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we, we, we tend to work with the concept of uh, building trust. Uh, it's a more generic than, uh, of course, not denying and, uh, uh, the fact that there, are, there, are, uh, uh, there is uh, such a thing as cyber crime, et cetera. But then we have to try to balance overall, you know, the economic benefits, the privacy concerns, and those aspects that uh, you were mentioning about, uh, uh, you know, hard 
problems about cyber crime, cyber terrorism. So it's it's basically some thoughts. I don't know. I, I would like sure. to to have your thoughts about that. Thanks. Uh, could I just offer a thought on um, you know um, it's you know w one thing that we emphasize is that it, there's you don't have to make a choice between the sort of economic prosperity from having an economic growth that we achieve from having the free flows of data. You have to choose between that and security of personal data. You know, with the right types of policies and procedures and encryption in place, you can secure that data anywhere in the cloud or when it flows across borders. That's far more important than those that offer the solution of data lo localization because that alone can be kept in a, oftentimes in a less secure environment. So that's just one, I think, um, if you will, smaller concept to keep that we emphasize when we talk about it. And I would just say on, on that, and they had a very good point too about the national security side. I think it, it's very important that we have very strong rule of law protections in place about um, about how data is accessed by our national security agencies. Um, you know, the citizens of our countries demand that we are, you know, access data in responsible ways and when, when um, protected by uh, the rule of law. Amen. Quanto se molto obrigado pela participación tu y tomar a ti. Uh, from the OIA's perspective, uh, although we want to clarify a couple of things. First of all, our program is in the Secretariat of Terrorism, but actually our, uh, our focus is much broader than just national security or counterterrorism because that, that doesn't work. It doesn't work like that, period. So it's, it's cyber security or digital security or information security as Brazil has Tell, told us many times uh, it should be dealt uh, according to the reality of uh, each country. In the case of Brazil, Brazil is, is a país, I want to say major, but it's a really big country. But, uh, and, and of course, the security or the national security, it will be, play an important role. That's something that uh, I don't know if Victor may want to, to mention later, happened in Mexico, and Laurent actually can say he, he witnessed the process in Mexico, and actually witnessed the process in Colombia, where those countries have uh, traditional national security issues. But that doesn't mean that there should not be an economic or socioeconomic focus on this, because at the end, we are talking on protecting the internet and the citizens of the country that rely on the, on the, on the internet. So the most important is to see what is the objective uh, of this strategy, make sure that is, we are able to achieve these objectives and, and then start from that. Uh, of course, and then actually um, Brazil, I always say Brazil, Mexico and Argentina Maybe they have in common they are federal governments, but the reality of these three countries is totally different uh, on their economic side, on their cultural side, on their language. So you cannot just copy and paste what it's seen from one country to other. So it's very important uh, maybe to, to, to see at detail what, what to do in, in, in each reality and tailor to the according needs of, of the country and taking the different perspective of the region. And I don't know if you want to, to complement with something and then we give the floor to the gentleman. You know, I, I agree with, uh, with, with your points, Belisario. If I can add up, um, like five years ago, so we set out to do our, you know, uh, to implement a national digital strategy. And it, it basically was focusing on government transformation, as you would call digitization of services. Um, also focusing on economic growth, using technology and ICTs as a, as a, as a channel, um, as a vehicle. Um, healthcare, you know, health, uh, e strategies, education, and so on, civic innovation, public participation, et, et cetera. Um, and we let a little bit the, 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 the cyber security and information security realm to our national security agencies, so the operational side of it. Um, we later, um, you know, realized that it has to be encompassed. It was not an optional policy that, you know, could be let only uh, driven by our national security agencies in an operational manner. Um, it had to be addressed you know, openly, it has to be discussed openly, it has to bridge uh, the gap of debate in between you know, what I mentioned around you know, the civil society groups that are 
have in their agenda uh, very strong points against or, or for privacy, um, that they don't prevent uh, cybersecurity policy to be implemented. They don't. But they're, they're the value of it, of having an open debate, it was that we figure out that we could implement it fully, used basically we reached that common goal, and was basically by implementing policy, uh, you know, establishing more trustworthy mechanisms in which government could implement it, of course, investigate and prosecute cybercrime, as well as, you know, protecting uh, civil liber liberties and human rights online. So that, that's the, the, the way that we found that we could uh, not only mature the conversation and have a, a more rich ecosystem in the country, much more uh, open and much more vocal um, with academia and so on, but in a way that we could implement it with, um, with a census, with a very basically a, um, um, with an agreement of all sorts uh, within different, different areas of, of, of the country. Yes, yeah, so thank you. Th there were many things in, in your point, but I think one, uh, one thing I do when I discover a new uh, national cybersecurity strategy that I didn't know, I, I start to read it. One thing I look for is the vision. And it may look like uh, something uh, easy, but, and it's sometimes just a couple sentences, that's enough, but what is the vision? Uh, very often there are strategies with many initiatives, many points, many, which are maybe good, but no vision. And so they are not really strategic. They are compilations of initiatives, but not really strategic documents. Um, the problem that countries face is that everything interrelates with everything in that, in that area. It's very difficult to think in silos. If, if the starting point is to think in terms of uh, who is going to do it, uh, it may f it's likely to fall into one part of the government at the expense of the others. I, uh, with uh, Colombia and Mexico, uh, as you just said, I mean, it was really interesting because you had this uh, huge efforts, great efforts to, to bring uh, ICTs, to bring uh, access to the internet, to the population for, for, you know, I remember Colombia saying, you know, one of the goal of the uh, Vive Digital was reduce poverty, a very clear mission statement, very clear objective, yet the cybersecurity process was all in another part of the government, more related to, uh, to national security or cr cyber crime. And, and, and my reaction was like, okay, you, 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 div you, div you promote the use of ICTs, but somehow those who will use it and those who promote it should not have any leadership, or I'm caricaturing it a little bit, but should not, lead this process when it comes to the risks that are related to the use. There is something wrong here. It should be more holistic. And of course, to make it holistic, you, you, you need to have different people with, from different ministries and including the national security and the others to come at the same table and discuss. And the problem here that is that uh, there are knowledge gaps. Uh, national security people see uh, the world from the perspective of national security and that they probably a good thing, right? Uh, and the same on the other side, you know, it, access is good and national security is not necessarily a priority of, of, of ministries of technology. So, so uh, there is a gap that needs to be bridged and the development of the vision is probably an exercise that, yes, you may end up with a single paragraph, but it's a fundamental paragraph. If everybody in the government agrees on that paragraph, then you can start to distribute the roles to the various parts with the leadership in the area where they lead, but cooperating with the others to ensure that it's, it's balanced and it works together. And perhaps one way to balance, we, we, we have that in, so I forgot to, of course I, did, I said I would not talk about it, but we have a recommendation on digital security risk management for economic and social prosperity, which includes um, recommendations for developing national cybersecurity strategies from that angle. And one is to, to um, get the leadership for this whole process, for this holistic process from the highest level of government. Because that's the level where things can be balanced appropriately. That's the, that's the level where uh, the competing objectives of the various sides can be balanced. So that's, that's perhaps one key. And privacy is essential, as you've, you've rightly noted. And again, it's, it's probably, uh, it probably helps to have a privacy framework that's there before. Uh, if there is no clear privacy framework, privacy protection framework there, 
then yes, it's going to be more complicated to develop both at the same time or to realize there are issues on one that touch on it. It's, it's interrelated. Actually, at the OECD, the working party, which deals with digital security, also deals with privacy protection. These two are very much interrelated. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Joan Lopez. I'm from Colombia. And we agree that um, cybersecurity is a long standing relationship in, mu in a multi stakeholder perspective. But the, the thing is, um, in, in the col Colombian government, they are creating public policies that ca can create risk for the citizens' rights. And they speak about transparency, and um, they give something like 10 days to comment 300 pages. And they think that this is transparency. And this is a, a, a multi-stakeholder perspective. But, uh, and also, when we try to, to participate in cyber security, they tend to um, think that we are trying to hurt the government. And we are creating those comments based on international standards created by the OECD. So I think it's important to speak about this issue of transparency on multi-stakeholder in cybersecurity when a government doesn't give us an out space to participate. My name is Gabriel Souto. I'm from Brazil for the program U5GF. Uh, I have a question about um, in the U European Union, we have the GDPR that is being uh, developed, 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 and I and I have a question about in the perspective of America, if uh, OAI uh, is concerned about this 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 team and in uh, another perspective about corporation and and, and the private sector if there is um, uh, a direction that or recommendations under the the cyber the cyber crimes and cyber security that they can adopt on the in, on this aspect thank you any other comments or questions? So regarding uh, uh, the comment, Mr. Lopez, and maybe Laura can uh, provide more inputs, because I know that Colombia is trying to get into the OECD process, and part of the recommendations were exactly the one that uh, you mentioned. I think they need to fulfill some some things for the OECD, but I don't know, I will, I will leave that to, to Laura. And we, we always try to, to promote the, the inclusion of, 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 the, of the multiple, multiple parties. Uh, regarding Mr. Soto uh, questions regarding the GDPR, um, I don't know if fortunately or unfortunately the organization works based on mandates. Uh, we are responsible for the cybersecurity mandates, of course, some, sometimes or many times privacy are very linked to, to to privacy issues. Right now, we haven't received that mandate to work on, on these issues, but of course, we always, for the technical secretariat, we do give recommendations uh, to governments to look at this. We actually work very closely uh, with the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Um, there was this, for example, in the case of, uh, we can say publicly, uh, we were working with the government of Guatemala. Uh, they were drafting a, a law uh, on cybercrime, and we suggest the government of Guatemala uh, to ask inputs from the Freedom of Expression uh, Commission, um, sorry, Freedom of Special Rapporteurship. Uh, they provide those inputs and they cover these, these issues. These are some cases, of course, because the Inter-American Commission is really behind reviewing critical cases. Doesn't mean that this is not critical. So it's always case by case. Uh, we do work very closely with the private sector. Uh, we have really close relationship with Microsoft, with Amazon. We are, for example, about to launch a report on critical infrastructure, a couple of white papers with these organizations. And 
I want to say that most of them recognize the importance of working together uh, with law enforcement and the final users. Uh, we train micro, for example, we are actually training youth people. Uh, we have different initiatives actually uh, available for them. So I know. If I can add a little bit um, about your question specifically. Well, of course, OEA is very different from the EU system, so we can never issue any sort of regulation like that and then make our member states adopt. But adding to what Belisari was saying, um, although we don't have a specific mandate, of course, we understand that privacy, as Laurent was mentioning, mm -hmm. it's important, information, privacy. So that's something that we especially include when we're discussing. We discuss with member states during the process of the development of national cybersecurity strategies. One of the questions, of course, when you're assessing the legislation, what do you have, what, what policies we implement? One of the questions of, do you have a data protection legislation? Uh, if not, well, it's always a topic that is uh, considered, and usually it does mention this sort of this concern about the importance of privacy. That's why first when we invite international experts, because this, uh, we can say it's a very good importance practice, we invite someone that is a cybersecurity and privacy risk <laughs> analyst to come with us yeah. to discuss this topic. So that's how we approach yeah. the matter. And just beside, before giving the floor to Laurent, what um, Barbara was saying, Usually when we went to, for example, when we went to Mexico or we were going to any country, it's not just OAS officials. There is a group of experts, uh, academia, civil society, private sector, governments, even uh, other international organizations from around the world that we try to provide recommendations. Some of them, they are considered, some of other are not. We are not a mandatory organization. We can just, provide certain recommendation based on the requests of the of the member state, but we are trying always to, to assist and do our best. I don't know if you want to add something else. I, 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 can, uh, I can try to respond to um, the point on the uh, transparency by actually responding to mm -hmm. Barbara's question at the beginning. Uh, once uh, there is agreement and consensus on the need for transparency, um, still there is a need to understand what it means concretely. Uh, and, and it's true that uh, recommendations like the one of the OECD, they set building blocks that are fundamental, uh, but they don't go into the details of how you implement it. So uh, what we do is we, we, we now start to dive into each of these building blocks and see what they concretely mean and what kind of good practice could we promote uh, through uh, our consensus process at the OECD for countries to, to, to have a better understanding of what they should do to be effective. Again, it's not so much a political thing, it's more like what works and what doesn't work. And in regard to transparency, the problem is not so much that it's, uh, well, it, it is of course a political problem not to do it well, but it's just not going to establish the trust that you need in order for people to act responsibly which means to actually do what they should do when they use ICTs. In other words, you may have a pol an immediate political benefit in, in d not being too transparent, but you have not solved your problem, which is to improve uh, cybersecurity risk management in your country. Um, I could name three things on the top of my head, of my head that are important to, to get the, um, uh, the trust. Uh, first, uh, it needs to be this cooperation uh, multi-stakeholder cooperation needs to be institutionalized. And to some extent, this is what we have done at the OECD ourselves. We have institutionalized the representation of the business and industry, the civil society, the technical community, and the trade unions. Um, so institutionalization is important because it shows that this is not a one-off, it's a long-term thing, a long-term uh, relationship. It's a mindset, it's a culture not just an immediate political benefit. Another aspect is a uh, the need for clear processes for the, for the, for the multi-stakeholder cooperation. It's not going to be, yeah, we do one workshop, you have 10 days, etc. It's going to be a, a, whole, a whole cycle, a whole life cycle that never ends because the strategy will be reviewed. It will be implemented. You will have to get the feedback on the implementation, etc. And so, of course, transparency is the last point. It's not just transparency of the, of the process, it's, uh, it's the, uh, all the documents, uh, 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 the transparency of uh, uh, who participates in the, so many countries establish groups 
which are long-standing with representatives of many stake different stakeholders. That's a way to, to institutionalize it, and all of this is transparent. In other words, getting out of the one-off, uh, let's get out the cybersecurity strategy, but more, let's create the conditions for a, uh, say a culture of digital security risk management or whatever, cybersecurity risk management, whatever you call it, uh, in the long run, because it's about a uh, uh, fundamental change to the economy and society that ICTs are bringing. It's not just one issue that will be solved. It's going to be with us for decades and decades. This is specific about the Colombian strategy. I always think it's important to also recognize the difference from 2011, 2016. If you're talking about first it was a cybersecurity and cyber defense strategy, and now it's a national digital security policy. They did introduce the topic of uh, the, the participation of interested parties. So, and actually it was very important not only for Colombia, for the region as well. It sent a very good message. It's perfect. Of course, it's a long-term process. There is a long way. But it started the institutionality, I think, that Lohan was saying, it's starting this process to make it more multi-stakeholder. So it's a beginning that is important to recognize as well and work with that because we have that in the strategy. And it was a very important uh, improvement. Of course, it's still a lot of work and our strategy is supposed to be reviewed in the future again. So, yeah. Just uh, quickly on, on, co on collaboration with private sector. Um, we, we in Mexico, we have basically uh, some collaboration agreements signed and also some tacit collaboration that, al that already happens. Um, and a lot of them with, uh, with private sector w within the U.S., of course, you know, the big social media outlets, of course, the content creators and so on, in which, for example, you know, if there is investigation happening um, and, you know, potential, you know, pe persons of interest that, that are going to be uh, investigated, you know, we do have those channels open with Facebook, with, with YouTube, with, uh, with um, Twitter um, still to be able to, to, um, to investigate fully. Um, and, I may, and I mention it like that because there's sometimes there's n not even a signed document, but it's a, it's, it's a very transparent process in which governments uh, get help and also global uh, corporations actually support the process itself. Um, I have to say that sometimes even the, the, the process itself is faster with some of, the, of these companies that even the telcos or ISPs within the country. Um, and finally, we do have some signed uh, agreements with, for example, Microsoft to be able to cooperate not only in best practices, but also co monitor and user even the, the SOCs, you know, the security centers that they, where they monitor, you know, spam flowing through or viruses going through or one going through and, and we're able to gain or gather more information and be able to share it to, to our citizens uh, in a more um, uh, fast, faster way, I guess. Final comment, question. Thank you very much. My name is Julia. I'm also from Brazil in the youth program, along with Gabrielle. And my question to touches a little the issue of transparency, but I would like to hear. Issue of? Transparency. Okay. But I'd like to hear from the panel, um, how do you see the militarization of cybersecurity, uh, especially in Brazil, because with the army has a center for monitoring um, social media, for instance, but the efforts for cyber crime, the, such as like fraud, 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 and money laundry, they're not so, um, folk, they don't have so much focus. So how do you see this, especially in America? For us, it will be very difficult to uh, <laughs> mention something about any other country because it's not, but uh, because you know, it's, uh, um, but again, uh, as, as we mentioned, like internet, it's uh, we we promote uh, at least from the general secretariat a free, open, uh, and secure internet. Uh, the armed forces should play uh, definitely a role, but actually the diplomats, the private sector, the civil society, everyone has a role to play. Uh, we are not in a, in a position to, to 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 provide judgment about about any country. I don't know if Rob, you want to mention something in general about the international or, or Victor. Or I just want you know I, I would yeah. just <laughs> uh, emphasize the, those points that that we really need to emphasize the ability of um, all citizens to speak freely and and, and emphasize their you know free, freely espouse views on the internet, participate in our democracy, and be in the public debate. Um, 
and uh, you know, fortunately, in the, in the, almost all the West, Western Hemisphere, that's that's very possible. Um, you know, we assess that the, the, in that freedom to be very strong in our in our hemisphere, uh, which is a very positive thing, and we want to see uh, around the world the more progress made for citizens to speak. And just on the, the sort of cyber crime, it, you know, one thing that we emphasize is the uh, the Budapest Convention. You know, from 2002. We think that provides some very important mechanisms for sharing information to go after cyber crime. Can I add up? Um, there's like two cents here. I believe, uh, you know, as I mentioned, it has to be implemented in a way that it's trans transparent and open. It has to be co-created. Also, um, we need to allow governments to have the tools to be able to um, prosecute and to investigate cyber crime. We need to allow ourselves to, to, to be protected in such a way when, you know, we are living in a country where, you know, certain things are happening, certain c crimes are, are being committed. Um, so, but those tools and mechanisms need to be, of course, legal and need to be implemented in such a way that, that, that are, are, are implemented in a trustworthy environment and can be actually shared, the, the mechanism itself. Um, you know, many countries that are in a situation, and I can only speak as to Mexico, where more and more, um, you know, ad advances in technology and more and more technologies have been implemented towards cybercrime, then you, you know, there needs to be a response towards that and, and technology gives you certain solutions. And while implementing those solutions, you know, could be perceived as militarization of, you know, of, of this reaction, it has to be done in collaboration with civil society groups and in collaboration with, you know, with legislation around it. You know, but that's, that's a conversation that needs to happen. Of course, it's not a misuse of these technologies towards massive monitoring and so on, but a use of this technology to be able to protect ourselves from the crime being committed, which is, you know, in the number state within Mexico at least, that we do have the numbers and the, you know, basically the, the, the cyber, cyber crime itself, it's actually happening in, within the country and needs to be investigated. With that, uh, I would like to say Victor, Ra, Oran, uh, Barbara, for your participation, and all of you for, for your time and interest for, for being here. Thank you very much, and we adjourn the session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. Looking forward to see you in the season. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hope to see you. Yeah, we'll get in touch. Bye, Bada. Yeah, see you. Oh, oh, oh. oh, I like it. <laughs> oh, yeah.
Wait and see. Wait and see where people sit. People are mostly sitting down this side on the roof. In the dark. In the dark. 